I'm here to talk about culture and how the constituents of um, the Herman Miller culture have enabled this company to build an incredible sustained innovation culture. So you already get the bag out of the hat. Yes, I left in 1998 uh, my beloved street in Paris and I also left my street art but I came with my husband and my two children to work for this company, Herman Miller, in Western Michigan and work in this beautiful farmyard, which was thought of the architect as a combination of um, learning at work like a shipyard or a schoolyard would represent. And actually, I just discovered that this is the real West Michigan that I actually <laughs> moved in. Or this kind of visual <laughs> that I would experience. And you know, after you get beyond that first level of emotion that is the coldness, there's actually a lot of warmth in the people here. And um, I have to say that it's now uh, many years later uh, and I just came to experience this, those beautiful icons that made this company um, so, so sought after. And I got to work on other cool stuff from far or from close. And now I have traveled a lot of places to understand how people work and how people live. And um, I wanted really genuinely to help them uh, benefit from better environments. To work, to live, to heal, to play, to study, and really build a better world around them. And now we're in 2009. I never thought I would stay that long. And I'm still here. Still feels a little bit in the middle of nowhere, but I really wanted to share with you what was actually at the heart of what actually made me, this, made me call this place home for these 11 years. So it's about that peculiar culture that's not yet as diverse as this, um, but that has actually been able to, starting in 1923, to build an incredible sustainable culture. And in order to help you and I reflect on the foundations of that culture, I have a few questions. The first one is to ask, is the culture a source of harmony? Or is it an effect of irreducible conflict of interest? And it truly depends if you believe that people are driven by values or by their own interest. Or is it a mix? Is it something that is the reflection of some ambiguities that pervade contemporary organizational life? And these ambiguities can actually be translated um, in the funding elements that made this small company that was already making furniture out of timber on the shores of Michigan um, to attract and to find happiness with the most renowned designer. And for those who don't know who Herman Miller is, it truly really was a person. But he never actually been part of the business. He's actually the person who, who helped DJ Dupre, his son-in-law, to get the money to, to get the company started out of an acquisition. So 1923, the company has flourished ever since. And I'm interested in understanding what are the elements from these foundations that have become consistent, that are pervaded through time, and what are the ones that under external factors or internal factor have provoked some changes, but actually changes that still have protected the core and those very intangible elements that um, continue to be present in everything the people do and, and think and how they interact. So does it have to be consistent? Um, does it have to be uh, inconsistent and expressive of, of personal differences? 
I don't really know, but there are some really cool models that uh, I'm going to mention to you later that kind of help crack the genome of this culture of innovation. Talking about consistency, um, there's a wonderful quote from George Nelson, who was uh, one of the key designers that came from New York and that was invited by the founder to actually bring a fresh uh, interpretation of what they were doing. And it, this statement that he made in 1952 is still very, very present and is still very much shared with a lot of designers that have worked with the company ever since. Um, and I'm just going to read them to you because they are so great. What you make is important, so you have to focus on the what. Design is an integral part of the business. Well, there's a lot of design firms today that are claiming this because that has to be there. That has to be in your mind, in your, in your heart, in everything you do. The product must be honest. Don't try to hide any elements of it. Just show to who's going to have a connection with the product, what it's made of and how it's been made. Uh, you decide what you will make. That was back then, that uh, possibilities that a small firm back then still um, could say, well, this is where I think I'm going to invite everybody to um, participate, and this is my vision of comfort, and this is my vision of ergonomics. Um, and finally, George was convinced back then that there was a market for good design. As I said, those, those elements have, have pervaded, but there are a few inconsistencies if you look today. Um, it's how you make that is essential. What you make is important, but how you make it became more important. Um, business can be an integral part of the design. So there is that tension between um, the, the necessity to make sense of and, and meaning and, and viable elements of what you do. And sometimes it's the market that decides, not us always. And to his last point, I guess, George, you know, there is a market for good design, but it's still not very big yet. <laughs> but we're all working to make it even bigger year after year. Um, so to crack the genome, I'm using a model that was developed by Edgar Schein uh, in the 80s, one of the most prominent um, um, person who has reflected on organizational culture. And I like his model because it goes from the visible to the invisible. And basically, it helps unpack the complexity of some constituent elements of a culture. So I'm going with a very short uh, presentation of the theory, but basically the three levels that he identify to um, talk about an organizational culture are the artifact, so basically what we see, and uh, element that um, sometimes send very strong signals, and we have to be cautious that we don't necessarily uh, misinterpret them, because some signals could be stronger than others. Um, the other layer that is right underneath is the values, and basically that's the greater level of awareness that uh, companies most of the time express in their mission statements. It's what is endorsed, what is espoused um, by presidents and CEOs in their organization. And the layer that is most of the time invisible is the basic assumption. What is typically taken for granted in a culture? What people talk about, but if you ask them to clearly express what it is, it will take a while before they can really articulate uh, the elements of the basic assumption. So if I apply this model to Herman Miller, I'm sure many of you know those artifacts that is about um, incredible performance in the product that are designed, materials, uh, accessories, uh, uh, products for healing environments, and also those elements that are less well known but are still important, designing for the environment, um, incredible knowledge about ergonomics and how people behave, how people move, um, how people interact, and a lot of um, work uh, that actually happens 
inside and outside the organization and that creates those ceremonies, those ritual and those elements that are about celebrating this incredible brand. Going to values, it's quite interesting because there are specifically nine values that are in everybody's mind and in everybody's uh, actions. Um, and if you go back to um, maybe the 1950s, most of them were there. And to me, I think it's an incredible element that shows that there is this consistency I was talking about earlier in what are the things you go back to when you don't necessarily have an answer in front of a given situation. Those are the, the nine elements that definitely drive a lot of decisions and a lot of actions in order to create a better world around us. Now, the fun stuff is the basic assumption and what I discovered after 11 years in the company, um, and as I say, that is not necessarily what gets uh, in front of you uh, when, when you go to West Michigan. And, and Shine was actually trying to describe that the basic assumption actually expressed themselves through seven elements. I'm not going to talk about the seven, but I'm going to highlight a few that I felt were probably the most interesting for you to remember, because the whole point, as I said, was to crack the genome. The first one is the relationship with the, between the company and the environment. And this guy has said in 1953, we will be good steward of the environment. And everything that ha has been developed since was to respect this beautiful nature uh, that surrounded uh, everybody in the company and just say that there's no way you can do anything that will harm this incredible location that uh, the company has had chosen to establish its location. So that's the first element that I think has been dr driving a lot of um, respect. The nature of the human activity. Here, I discovered when I came from Paris an incredible work ethic. Uh, there's a dedication to um, being honest. There's a dedication to be uh, very um, focused on quality, on doing good thing, on doing right thing. I think some of it could have some religious elements that have invited the, the people who've been in West Michigan for a long time to be highly um, good in the way they think and in the, in the way they want to do the right thing for, for the world and, and, and for their community. Um, the nature of rea reality and truth, that, that's not an easy one to tackle when, when you try to decode the genome. And one of the elements that I thought was quite interesting is well, there were all those designers coming from many different cultures and many different places, and were there any conflicts of style? Well, there was. Um, but the thing is, as soon as design was focusing on values, then the conflicts became just minimal. So it's really an important element for me that um, the, the way that, that reality and truth was actually unfolded over the um, thinking and the development of an incredible design is that values were always the, the factor that were reuniting those designers coming from far away and the people in, in, in West Michigan. Um, the human nature, an excellent level of craftsmanship and um, a real dedication to wood that then evolved into other materials, but incredible talent, again, focused on quality and willing to help the designers to, to get the best that they could to express physically what they were looking for. The nature of human relationship extremely cooperative. Sometimes you wonder when you look at this model, you know, is it going towards harmonization or is it going towards cooperation or competition? I found a culture very cooperative, lots of community-driven projects, um, building habitat, 
uh, for the population in need, uh, whether it happens in, in Michigan or in other locations that had uh, gone under major disasters, uh, a real dedication to come and help and support. And you see that in the everyday work and also in the way that um, people who are not necessarily from the region have been um, embraced and welcomed. And finally, the last point is, is it a, a basic assumption that is going more towards homogeneity or heterogeneity? And I have to say it's quite homogeneous, but again, because there is no in-house designers in this culture, that they are the one that brought the diversity into the culture. And then if you see it as an evolving element, all those new ideas that came um, be became some elements of, of, of building the future. So that's how I, I, I would um, crack the genome. And um, I have some, um, of course, cool representation of what it did. But I think what is really important is to remember that it's a combination of people, of location, of encounters, of incredible foundational uh, elements that were part of the company since 1923 that have led to this, to this cool innovation. Now, I have a few questions for you. Um, I don't know if they are the ones that you, that you ask us to, to pose, uh, Gary, but I think that they are quite big questions because the, the point now is how do we go from 2009 to 2050? And how do you choose what part of a culture or a history you want to pick to move forward? Because I think that uh, there's a lot to think about the past as a way to interpret our future. So what will the scope of work encompass for building a better world in 2050? And now I have an, inc an incredible quote, again, from the son of the founder, Max Dupree, that I think is one of the most interesting way to um, describe innovation. There are two ways of competing in this business. You can nickel and dime the competition to death, or you can take giant step that will distinguish you from them. But to the only way to have giant steps is to have giants. So if you think about you, which are the giants from today that you'd like to take with you into the future? If you had to choose who? And if you think of a moment in your history and in your culture, and you like to take it and move it forward, what would it be? So I'm going to leave you with these questions, because at the moment that you have answered to the what and to the who, then all the other questions will be very easy. And you'll be ready to decode your own cultural genome. Thank you. Thank you.